This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. I'm your host, Rabonzo. The podcast features conversations with indie music artist musicians. These conversations are intended to help other musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. So as you know, I love sharing my personal experience and the things I'm learning from other musicians and songwriters here on the podcast. And you also know that you can be privy to those learnings by joining the Unstarving Musician community. In the process, you probably also know you'll be supporting this podcast. Just go to unstarvingmusician.com to join. In doing so, you'll get an email from me usually every 7 to 10 days with tips, hacks, insights, tricks, all the things you need to know to make your music journey a little better and brighter. And you'll also get a free gift from me, a token of my appreciation for being part of the Unstarving Musician movement. Singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist Sylvia Rose Novak grew up in Opelika, Alabama. This is a place I'd never heard of before our conversation. And I asked her what it was like growing up in the South, and she said it was a little weird. I gathered from some reading that she didn't exactly fit in, but she's still in Alabama, so I know she didn't and doesn't find it at all a bad place. It's home after all. This is one of the more casual conversations I've had on the podcast. That was my doing. We talk a little bit about going from writing her first song to becoming a career musician, doing a vinyl package for her latest release because she wanted to hear herself on vinyl, and bourbon. She likes bourbon. She gives me some beginner suggestions for where I can begin my bourbon journey, and why she bothered to make her first album to begin with. She also tells us about, tells me rather, about her plans for the new year and something called squatching, one of her many interests. Reading or listening between the lines, I found this to be a conversation of inspiration and I hope you enjoy it. Here's me and Sylvia Rose Novak. Oh, but before we get to the conversation, I almost forgot. You are going to hear a song at the end of the episode or at the end of the conversation called Santa Ana. It was written as a fundraising effort for the Thomas Fire Fund in the wake of the 2017 Southern California fires and was released as the um, closing track on Someone Else's War. The um, song still lives in that it is helping... Um, victims of the current California fires here in the, as we wrap up 2018. And I know that Sylvia Rose would love nothing more than to continue supporting those folks. It's a great track. I know you're going to love it. And people are going to love you for supporting them in the process of loving it. Again, here's me and Sylvia Rose Novak. Tell me um, about growing up in Opelika, Alabama. It was kind of weird, um, but not bad. I always felt a little bit out of place because, you know, like my biography said, my parents are not Southern, and almost everybody else that I grew up with in Opelika was. I mean, their family lived here for ever and ever and ever, and, you know, their grandma, great-grandma, all of their cousins. Everybody lived super close, and everybody was a Baptist. <laughs> None of those things applied to me, and I just felt like an alien. But I had a lot of friends, and I was in the band, and it was just—it was strange because I was never. And I love the South. I'm actually sitting here wearing my bitter Southern or South T-shirt right now. But um, bitter Southern or no, like South. When I was, so the bitter Southerner is a publication I like a lot, and they have a T-shirt that just says South <laughs> on it. Nice, and that's my favorite T-shirt like ever, but you know, it's funny because growing up, I never felt Southern. (laughs) So different. It was different, but not bad. And when you say the band, was that the church band, the high school band or just your band or? Uh, uh, high school bands. And I had a couple of bands. I was in a band called one word (laughs) when I was in seventh grade and I was the bass player and it was me and my friend, Adam, and Adam. <laughs> were you guys any good as seventh graders? I mean, I thought we were great. We covered breakfast at Tiffany's like only seventh graders could. Oh my God. <laughs> That's yeah. great. I think I, um, I think I, uh, a drummer friend of mine in, in, uh, I lived in, in Arlington, Texas for much of my life. And I think one of my, um, friends, uh, Earl Darling played drums with those guys for a while with the um, 
<laughs> not the the breakfast at Tiffany guys. What were their names? Uh, the Deep band? blue something. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Deep blue yep. something. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't know. Every that, time I hear that song, I'm in seventh grade again. That's funny. Playing a crappy band. That's so funny. I asked because I think that's about the time that I started playing, and I, I, I remember thinking like how awesome we were. Of course, you know, really just finding our way on our instruments, but, but I think as seventh graders, we were actually pretty good. <laughs> I like to think so too. Like, but I'm like, maybe, maybe it was good. I stuck with bass. I still play it. So obviously I wasn't terrible. So speaking of that, what you play a lot of instruments. It sounds like what's your favorite instrument. That's tough because I love being a bassist. Like I love playing bass, but I also love being a fiddle player. It just kind of depends on the context of the band and the mood I'm in. Yeah. Um, Bass I've been playing for a lot longer than fiddle, so it's always kind of my first love, and it just feels really comfortable, like going home. But fiddle's a ton of fun when I'm allowed to do what I want to do. I've played in a lot of bands where I've had to play like Colin Baton Rouge six times in the same night. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not and that's not my favorite thing in the world, but I do like playing fiddle. So you mentioned that your your stature is pretty small. Do you play a fair like a lot of times when I see girls playing bass, uh, the the instrument looks so big. But do you pl- what what type of bass do you play normally? I play my favorite bass is I own a 1989 Gibson Thunderbird. Uh, I bought it from Shauna Tucker from the Drive By Truckers. Mm-hmm. That's how a lot of people know her. But mm-hmm. she's got like a second solo project coming out soon, and she's one of the nicest people I've ever had the pleasure to meet. And that bass is just unreal. It's so cool, but it's huge. I look ridiculous <laughs> playing it. Um, whenever I've seen Cheryl Crow play bass, it always looks to me that the guitar of her choice is pretty, <laughs> pretty big, and she's you know relatively small stature too. So anyway, it looks kind of heavy on a small person, but that's cool. It does, but I have to hold it. Every picture of me playing it, it's like tilted upright, so I can reach. It was a coping mechanism, I guess, from the time I was a kid. Cause I hit this height in seventh grade when I was playing bass and didn't get any taller. <laughs> so when I played standing up, I'd have to cock it up on my hip so I could use the full scale. That's funny. So when you tilt it up, are you talking about like Bill Wyman sort of tilted up? So you... Yeah, exactly. But it's not to look cool. Uh, it's so that if I need to use my low E string, <laughs> I can. can reach it. <laughs> you know, Somebody... and I don't actually, I don't, I don't play in a lot of open positions. I play mostly off of the fifth fret. Uh, because it's just easier for me to reach. <laughs> That's great. So, <laughs> but uh, I'd rather do that than buy a three-quarter scale. <laughs> all right. Well, hey. <laughs> and, and, and now I read that um, the family says you were singing really early and that you were not only doing that but at a very young age, but you were um, also able to harmonize at a really young age. When uh, did you have your first like lessons or any sort of formal training? And uh, gathered cause, um, as we first started talking, you were in um, a high, in the high school band, so I know you got some there. But did was there anything prior to that? There was. Um, I never took vocal lessons or anything, but I started taking piano lessons when I was eight, maybe. Yeah, it, I think I was about eight years old. Have you taken, so how old are you now, if I may ask? I know you're young, so you don't mind uh, saying, right? I'll be 29 in about a month. Oh, so my goodness. I say 20, I'll say i say 28, you know, because <laughs> I'm going to hang on to that. Back when I was 20 and was almost 21, I'd be like, I'm almost 21. Now I'm almost 29. I'm like, I'm 28. <laughs> Just call your 30th birthday when it comes, your second annual 29th birthday, and keep going from there for a while until you have to start saying your second annual 39th birthday. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> it's a good plan. Yeah. Okay. Where was I? We were talking. I was asking you um, how old you were, and I did that for a reason. All right. Well, let's move on until it comes back to me. Um, <laughs> so we, we, we were earlier talking about you growing up in the South. It was a little odd, not bad, but I'd also read on your website, I believe, that uh, you were are seen as having sort of bucked against many of the conventions and mores of the South that said... Um, during your formative years, what, are there things that stick out in your mind that just weren't really <laughs> <laughs> you? Yeah. The weirdest one to me, and this is so funny, but you know, you can't control what comes to your brain when people ask you questions. There, there, there were a lot of them. And again, you know, like the more serious ones were like where I went to like the church that my friends went to, they told 
everybody that mental illness was caused by demons. And I was like, I don't think that's right. But the one that I think (laughs) about most, you know, the one I think, the one I think about most often is I went to one of my best friends in middle school Thanksgiving with her family and I got there and they had deep fried the turkey and there was potato salad. And I was like, this is wrong. This is not how you do Thanksgiving. And I came to discover like the older I got that that was not uncommon. The deep fried the, turkey or that the, was, <laughs> the potatoes, like the lack of mashed potatoes in a oh, traditional yeah. roast turkey, but that was just like a Southern thing. I didn't even know that. I have a younger brother who, I mean, we grew up in, in Dallas, Fort Worth and, but I have a younger brother who, um, uh, somewhat later in life just got into frying turkeys for Thanksgiving and he just loves it. And you know, he'll fry them for the neighbors <laughs> and stuff. And I didn't really have any idea and I never asked him where it comes from. So it's a, it's a, a Southern thing though, huh? I I guess that's the only place I was ever exposed to it was uh, my friend's stepdad and her mom having a very animated conversation about how the turkey has to be 100% defrosted before it goes in the deep fryer or else it turns into a bomb. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, (laughs) yeah. It's like weird childhood memories that stuck with me, but I'm like, and then I had somebody ask me years later, they're like, you know, deep fried turkey. I was like, well, I know it can't be frozen. Yeah, don't try and fry it frozen. I remember when we moved um, our first Thanksgiving in California, we moved to, to San Jose from Texas, and I thought that everybody had black eyed peas on New Year's Day. It was not Thanksgiving, New Year's Day. And turns out it was Texas, maybe, and some other southern ish places and people in California didn't and they didn't even know what I was talking about. So yeah, different traditions. Oh yeah, in Alabama you have to have your ham hock and your greens and your black eyed peas or it's bad luck. Yeah, wow. Okay, so back to music. I know what I was going to ask you where I was um, asking the whole how old are you thing came and so I wanted to ask you now um, or since the early education that we touched on, have you done vocal coaching or training since then or do you just sort of magically have Mm -mm. this great voice from lots of practice on your own? (laughs) I just magically have this voice and I actually hated my voice for a long time. Hated it. Um, cause I thought it was supposed to sound one way and it didn't. Yeah. And I, I know, but I never had vocal coaching. I never had vocal lessons. Um, I was just, I had these songs that I wrote and I didn't want anybody else to sing them. Yeah. So I did it myself. Um, I know it's not magic, by the way. I know that you're putting in your 10,000 hours and that's why you sound as good as the way you do. It's funny you mentioned that. Um, I assume that you're comfortable with the sound of your own voice these days after doing it for a while, yes? Uh, in the sort of way that, like, you can look at yourself in the mirror after, like, a hearty meal and know, like, this is just the body I live in. Like, this is just the voice I have. <laughs> I never, <laughs> you know, I never, like, listen to myself and go, God, my voice is one way or the other. I'm like, oh, that's me. And I used to be like, please turn that off. That's funny. But that's funny. I'm remembering. Um, so I, I don't think I've spent, I, I certainly have not spent as many hours singing as you have, but I do sing. And um, I remember or think back about having, being able to listen to anytime somebody catches a recording. I don't do, um, I've done very little recording um uh, singing and done just a lot of demo work as a drummer, which is my main thing. But um, I, I, I often think, yeah, there was a time where I couldn't stand to listen to my voice, but now I can actually listen to it. And even on the the podcast, nowadays I listen to things like how many times I say, um, or I think I sound like William <laughs> Shatner because when I'm trying to get a thought out, I tend to have all these pauses um, before I can get a sentence out. But, but I can actually listen to my voice so I can relate. Okay, so I want to ask you about your album. So Someone Else's War... Uh, is your latest, and I was curious to know if you personally feel, um, so your prior two releases were in 2016 and 2014, and I understand Chasing Ghosts got some uh, a lot of accolades, and um, I've listened to it, and the 2016 release the last three years. Do you personally feel there's um, a lot or any difference between your current release and say, um, the one prior and going back to the first? And, and if so, what are, what are the big differences for you? Um, the biggest differences are that I, 
I guess, so my first album, Chase and Ghost, was actually my first, like, real songwriting effort at all. I didn't write songs until, like, 2013, and I just kind of messed around with it then. And I kind of was one of those people who, I am one of those people, when I set my mind to something, it's going to happen. So I decided, you know, like, I'm going to make a record. And and this was after I wrote a couple of songs. And I produced everything myself. But you can tell in my first album, definitely, that I was kind of searching for a sound. There's a lot going on there that's very different. And I like the record. I'm proud of it now. But um, I, I feel like with someone else's war, I finally have figured out the direction I want to go. It feels more comfortable and more correct to listen to that versus the other record. Did you self If that makes sense. Yeah. Did you self produce uh, the 2016 release? I did. And the current one? Yes. Okay. So you're just getting so more, more comfortable it, as a producer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's more indicative of my production style, I think. And it helped this time. And I, I love, I love the engineer who worked with me on the 2014 and 2016 releases for the engineering part of it. And I've had the same mixing and mastering engineer on all of them. His name's Rory Kilcullen, and he's one of my favorite people in the world. But the recording engineer on the first two and on this one were the, was, was a different thing. And it, this time it was Lester Newby. And Les never fought me. The engineer on my first two records was very close to me. We dated for five years, um, close to five years. Uh, off and on. And so that was kind of tough because we, we butted heads a lot and I, I never really just put my foot down and went, no, this is what we're doing on this track. This is what we're doing. And with this release, I did, I was like, this is it. This is what we're doing. So, so. moral never let a, an ex or a boyfriend, a boyfriend or an ex-boyfriend engineer your album then, right? No. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say so, but I would, I mean, He's done really amazing work, and actually, he shot my album cover, so we're still very close. He's an amazing photographer, but I think that there has to be some separation. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was. Just, I think there does. Sure, I, and I'm sure it was also, um, you know, like a relationship thing, and and uh, and personalities and all that stuff. So anyway, uh, uh, he did a great job anyway. But um, okay, that's that's interesting though. Um, yeah. And what about from a songwriting perspective? Uh, so you wrote, you said you wrote your first song in 2013. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel it's going from then and now? Um, I have never really been big about writing about myself, but my first record, there are a handful of songs about people very close to me. Like one of the, one of the best songs or the most well-loved songs off of that first album is called burn it down. And it's about a friend's divorce. And, uh, on the second record, the last three years, it was basically about the last four years of my life. So there was some interpersonal writing and some closeness, but on this latest record, I wrote more broadly, kind of about the human condition and like people I didn't know in their stories. And there is some, you know, as with every piece of writing, any psychologist would tell me, well, I mean, there are definitely aspects of you in this song. Yeah, but (laughs) that's not... (laughs) That wasn't the intention. And I think that I personally am more comfortable when I'm reaching broadly, when I'm thinking about things that affect me that aren't me. You know, and I suspect that over the course of your career that that will sort of move around in your songwriting, meaning that you may continue to, to, I guess, expand on that, the experience that you're having now where you're writing about things that aren't necessarily about you and maybe come back to things or, or I don't know, this is the first time that you would do it, but um, begin writing things about you. But I, I had read this about you and I found it particularly fascinating because as I've, since starting the podcast, I've had, uh, you know, great opportunities to talk to a lot of great uh, songwriters. And one of the things that caught my attention right away is that so many of them do write about (laughs) <laughs> them, uh, you know, their own lives and themselves. And um, I, I think growing up, and I've said this before on the podcast, I think growing up and listening to some of my favorite artists, I, I just kind of assumed early on that they were writing a, 
stories about other places and people. And I know sometimes they were. And then I come to find out that a lot of these things are autobiographical. But it, it caught my attention, though. So Chasing Ghosts, was that a little less like it is now? And you were did you say you were writing a little bit more um, about the immediate things in your life at that time? Yeah, Chasing Ghosts. <laughs> so uh, Chasing Ghosts was funny because I was struggling through trying to figure out what, you know, I was 23 when I wrote most of that stuff and was trying to figure out what I was doing, what I wanted, where I stood with a lot of people. Um, I had been training horses professionally full time and was coming out of this relationship and eyeing a move to a bigger city. And, uh, I'm really, really talented at projecting my own feelings into other situations so that I don't have to acknowledge that they're about me. But in <laughs> hindsight, I can look back on the record and go, you know, the song that I wrote about my friend's divorce was also about some of my bad relationships or, you know, it's sure. all kind of projecting, but yeah, so it was. And I'm, I'm sure and the more I actually look back on my latest release on someone else's war, the more I kind of recognize the interpersonal weavings of the songs, even though a lot of them are, are pointedly about something different. Sure. That's funny. You know, you remind me of, of um, something I say often when I'm talking to my wife, but, you know, I'll look at some of my friends as we get older and I tell my wife, I'm like, God, they they looked old to me you know, when we saw them last time. And, and then I've come to realize, I'm like, you know, I'm just looking in the mirror. It's me that looks old to them. <laughs> but I suppose that when you were, um, I was being sort of uh, making an analogy that you look back on that stuff and um, realize, hey, that was a little bit about me too. So you say that when you, um, you've always been, I don't know if the, uh, not exactly your words, but you're pretty determined when you decide you want to do something. So you said, I'm going to make a record. What did that look like? Right. Yeah. What did that look like for you at the time when you said uh, that and, and made it happen? It, so I am, and I will, in the interest of full disclosure, tell you that I am one of the most stubborn people on planet earth. The worst thing that anybody could ever say to me is you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You're not good at that. <laughs> My response is, oh, really? Okay. I'm going to do it. <laughs> or, yes, I am. Watch. Watch me. Okay, hold my beer. Watch this. Absolutely, you know. And um, <laughs> Hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, hold my beer. Watch this. And that was that record. That first record was, all right, hold my beer. Watch this. Because I was playing music and kind of involved with that engineer. And a lot of people around me were super encouraging. But then there were a lot of people, uh, namely people close to me, they were like, you know, you can't sing like this person. You don't have the voice of this person like that. I mean, that song's fine. But then I had these close friends who were like, you're amazing. You should do this. And I was like, yeah, fine, fine, fine. I guess I will. And then one day the, uh, you can't do this. You're not good enough outweighed the, you should do this. You're amazing. Which is, I know the opposite that it goes for most people, but I was like, oh, okay. You don't think I can do this. Watch me do this. And it was the most beautiful, brilliant, like thing I've ever been connected to outside of horses in my life. And I felt just completely and totally immersed. Like it was, I was like, this is, I came to life. I felt like after kind of sleepwalking for 23 years, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to write these words down and put them on tape and let people hear them. This matters to somebody. And it has, and that's been the most amazing part. Do you so still have that strong you know, feeling? Do you still have that strong feeling? Yeah. Now? That's nice. Yeah. This is it for me. This is what I'm, I'm made for in whatever weird cosmic energy star stuff composes my body and my brain. Like it is supposed to sing words at other people in the hopes that it helps them. I've always wanted to be an activist. Like that's was like my 18 year old dream. And I'm figuring out that I can do it this way. That's nice. I can help. Yeah. I like that. So what did, so you write your first song around 2013, you recorded an album in 2014. And I wanted to ask what was going from your first song to a full-time career in music? Um, I mean, how did it, 
how did it get to where it is today? If, <laughs> I don't know if that's too general, but you- no, it's a good question. Um, I was playing fiddle with a bunch of people. Like I just was everybody's fiddle player. So when I decided to step out and do my own thing, I had a huge support system. And uh, got really lucky, I guess. I worked really hard, but I got lucky that I had a lot of friends who cared and wanted to help me and see me succeed. That's so important. I kind of, <laughs> yeah, I just never had a choice. You know, when you decide to do this thing and you have all of these people behind you going, go, go, go. You're like, okay, okay, I'm going. <laughs> all right. And I'm so thankful for that because I still have that and a growing support system constantly. And without other musicians, you know, the players in my band, my husband, my best friend, my parent, people like Abe, who, you know, reached out to you about this, me for reached out to me, reached out to you about this podcast. Like I wouldn't have anything if I didn't have these people. That's so nice. So nice. What are you working on right now? As we get close to the end of the year. <laughs> I am releasing uh, six A and B side singles next year. One every two months. I love that. I've talked to a couple of artists, uh, not who are doing specifically that, but um, and they probably get on it like at the end of the year about this time. But earlier this year, I think I first ran across it. I think I, I um, interviewed a guy named Joe George. He... Um, he writes music a lot. He, his, uh, he's got a day job with, um, reverb.com. And oh, he, he yeah. Does, he does okay. A, yeah. He does a lot of guitar demos online and, um, and just oddly, um, well, I, I brought him up because at the time he told me that he was releasing a new song and a video each month of this year, which reminds me, I need to go back and see what his latest stuff is. But I thought that was so neat. And so I've run across, you might be the only the third person of all the people I've talked to that actually told me that, but that's very exciting. So are you already, um, do you already have some of that in the can, so to speak, or are you going to start on it in January? Or We will start on it in January. Um, I have all the songs written. I've got like 20 unreleased songs and they just, maybe one day I'll do like a big Bob Dylan-esque box set, but, I've got 12 that I've slated to release and I got picked. I won a straight to vinyl session uh, in Brooklyn that I'm doing in July. Tell me about that. And what that's going to be really fun. I am not a holy shirt. Hold on. Kellen, Kellen's my husband. Who did I win that with? Do you remember? Least of all sound recording. Um, least of all like mm-hmm. the least okay. yeah the least of all <laughs> least of all sound recording so i won that with them and i will be doing that i wrote a song recently that i feel very attached to um actually I've written a lot of songs very recently that i feel pretty attached to but the one i'm going to do on the straight to vinyl is a song called south of boulder unless i write something better that i like more in the next six months which is not impossible. It happens all the time. I change my favorite song of mine at least every three weeks. <laughs> so wait, are but they? They will all be available. Are they over going, the course of the next year? Cool. Are they going to? Is that session or sessions going to sort of kick off the AB single thing in the new no, year? No, we're starting that starting that in January. Oh, so okay. I'll do like half of the year with like two songs every two months, and then in the middle of the year. I'll release this straight to vinyl single, which is going to be really cool. And then I'll finish out the year with six more. Nice. And will you be performing or touring or anything like that as well? Yes, a lot starting in March. And so do you, um, you know, obviously you do some performing locally. Do you travel a lot for performing normally? We travel more than we play locally for sure. Do you um, go, I, I ask this to almost everyone these days, but do you, do you do house concerts as well? Oh, I love house concerts. I just wish more people would book. You know, I wish more people would do them. I wish more people would book me for them. They're one of my favorite things in the whole world. Well, you know, 
I have it on good authority. You have an email list, right? Uh, I need to get that updated. (laughs) Well, I have it on good authority. If you grow in your email list and and work with your social following, you just ask your fans who wants to host a house concert and you'll have all, you'll have not only people hosting you for house concerts where you need them and when you need them, but you'll have people that are super connected to the work you're doing and support what you do already. They won't just be, um, you know, maybe somebody who hosts a series each year that only has enough room for 12 throughout the course of the year, but there'll be people, people who really care about you. So like super care about you. (laughs) Utilize that a little bit better. Definitely. I had, um, I've always felt awkward though. I am a, an awkward emailer, an over explainer. So I don't know, maybe people will be (laughs) by that. You know what? (laughs) You know, I, um, you know, I'm still learning this as well. Uh, and I've been doing the whole email thing for a while, but I still feel like I'm learning from others. But, <clears throat> you know, the um, people that want to hear from you want to know about your quirky over explaining anyway. And, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, when, uh, when you ask them about that kind of thing, the people who are who voluntarily signed up for your email list because they want to know where you're going to be and know more about you. They'll love it. I promise. I was going to mention, I had a recent episode with uh, a woman named Shannon Curtis. Have you heard of her? I have not, but I like hearing about new people. Um, so I became very fascinated with her through a guy named Tom Meany, um, who's based out of Austin. He is a self-appointed ambassador for house concerts. And he mentioned this book that she wrote on house concerts and told me a little bit about her. And I'd seen her name prior to that. And some, another guest had mentioned her. And so I, you know, finally reach out to her and I wait months for her to get off her house concert tour. <laughs> That's all she does, by the way. She That's just, the dream. She just does house concert tours. But anyway, um, it is an episode really worth listening to. And she's got a very concise easy read book about that she's trying to update because people are always asking her how she did it. So she's like, why well, should you know, write out? She's got a great little book on it. And, um, she's, it's not the only episode I've done on either, but there's definitely, um, she's kind of been the, um, indirect source of inspiration for my interest in house concerts and always talking to guests about it. But if you love them, boy, I think you should go after them or someone should tell I you do. you can't do it. <laughs> That's what it would take. It was, You know, I want to play huge rock. I have a huge loud band too that I like to tour with. I love my loud, my loud band. I love playing through all my weird pedals and playing my fiddle through an amp and just being like riotous on stage. But I also really love house concerts because I can be sitting three feet for standing three feet from somebody and say the same asinine thing I would say over the microphone, and I get to see the expression on their face when it leaves (laughs) my mouth. Yeah, and they're generally charmed. It sounds like a, it sounds like a really rewarding sort of uh, th- uh, you know experience to do for both the artists and the people who attend them and uh, and also will help fund your career quite well. <laughs> and, so uh, I've heard. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love hearing that you have a really loud band that you love too. I I feel like I you know I talk to a lot of songwriters. Love it. Love talking to songwriters. But I've always been a band person. You know, a band guy myself. And and I love you know, I love playing loud stuff. I don't do it all the time. And in fact, you know, it's more generally playing in acoustic environments and, you know, working on these, um, controlled dynamic, you know, shows. Um, but, uh, yeah, I love hearing that. So when you guys are doing the loud shows, um, what, what's, yeah, what are you playing musically? Um, I switch actually, I switch between fiddle and bass, uh, when we play the loud shows and it's, really fun and gimmicky for people who don't know me or haven't seen me before or at the end of the night, you know, I, the bass player picks up a guitar and I grab the bass and they're like, Whoa, what's happening? But yeah, yeah I play my, actually I, my rig, my, my fiddle, I play through a pedal board. Um, <laughs> I've been playing with pedals since I started really playing the fiddle out live because I found that, running my fiddle dry through sound systems was awful uh, (laughs) for lack of a better word. And I wanted amplification too. Like I wanted it to sound like it belonged with the bands I was playing in, you know, not like a bluegrass session. So uh, that's kind of how I always made my sound. So I've had like a lot of different overdrive pedals. I've got a micro pog, you know, that does the octave shifting and, I do delay and reverb and all sorts of fun stuff. 
Do you have any good live recordings uh, these days? I know those aren't easy to put together, but do you have any? I'd love to check them out. I don't. There's some videos. There's some live video, but we should get some. Uh, we should get some. I'll work on that in the next year, actually. Well, I just need to find out where you're playing in that loud band and come see you so I can <laughs> see what it's all about. So, um, uh, It's really fun. It's a really fun show. I'm sure. Uh, tell me, another thing I was a little fascinated about... Um, uh, that you've done, I'm fa- I was interested in the fact that you did a vinyl package for your latest album. And is it the first time that you've done it? It is. And I'm still waiting on presses. So like I'm sending out my mailers for my rewards and um, sending really nice letters to everybody who's still waiting on this. Like, thank you for being patient. I can't control how this happens, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, because I'm only in charge of making the music and ordering it. Not when it comes alive. Why did but you people choose are really to, understanding and super cool. <laughs> yeah, why did you choose to do a vinyl package, vinyl release? Uh, I like vinyl. I like buying vinyl. That's yeah. was pretty much my only inspiration was I, I think vinyl's great, and I think a lot of these songs will translate well on vinyl. Basically, it's selfish. I wanted to hear myself on vinyl. You know, I wonder if that is why uh has anything or something to do with the other artists that I've talked to that do it. Um, I... I I've talked to a couple that are, you know, talk about the fact that it shows people, people that had fun at the show want to take a piece of something, piece of you, something home with them. And, um, vinyl's pretty awesome. And, and obviously it's, you know, made a comeback, um, and, and people are getting into it again. But, uh, yeah, I hadn't, hadn't thought, and I don't know that I I had heard from anyone yet that like, I just love vinyl. I want, <laughs> I like that. I wanted to hear myself on vinyl. It's great. It seems like a perfect yeah, reason. I think vinyl's so cool. And I was like, well, I make records. Why can't I like, I'm, I want a vinyl of me. Like that's so, that sounds so narcissistic. It's probably why nobody says it out loud, but it's true. Where are they being, who's, who's pressing them? Where are they being done? Um, I can't remember the name of the place right now. I'd have to pull up my email, but it's out of Virginia. Okay. Um, I'm really bad with names, by the way, of places. And also I had to ask my husband about the straight to vinyl session in the summer. I was like, oh, I can't remember. <laughs> That's right. I can relate. <laughs> I have I a terrible relate. memory. I have a terrible memory. I can relate. Well, I hope it's a, a huge success for you. I, I'd love to see more artists do it. Um, and I don't know if, do you do CDs anymore? I have CDs for press packs, um, like just for press mailers. But I had some left over because you can only order like a certain, you know, minimum quantity of them. It's kind of so been selling people. People yeah. have been buying them. I've been surprised. I, you know, and I know, I think it's like people want something of you. And, but I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of funny. You know, we went from, Nobody would, nobody cared about vinyl for a while. Everyone's buying these CD things and now streaming music. And I suspect most CDs are coasters now and people are buying vinyl because they'll actually play them, which is kind of funny. Mm-hmm. But, um, so what else merchandise wise do you do? Do you do things at your show? Like anything that's, um, I saw a couple of items on your website, including the vinyl package. Do you do any other merchandising at your shows? Uh, t-shirts. I've just got a new run of t-shirts in and I love them. I'm really proud of them. Ah, I did see they those. Were print- are they the ones on your website? Yeah. They look great. They are. Um, I was thrilled about those. They were printed by one of my favorite people in the entire world, Scott Peake, who owns the venue Standard Deluxe in Waverly, Alabama. Waverly, Alabama. Yeah, that's a great so shirt. He is, he is a killer venue owner, and he did the print, but uh, Scott Fuller out of Atlanta with the studio temporary did the design because the song we talked on the phone a couple times and the song. So I basically was like, here, listen to my record and tell me what you want to create. Um, and he was totally into that. And the song that stuck out to him on my album was bombs and blossoms. So he did the atomic warhead flower design. (laughs) And I thought that was the best thing I'd ever seen in my whole life. Like I'm keep trying to get my drummer to put it on his kick drum head. He's like, uh, that'll cost you. He's like, if you buy it, I won't. You know, no, he will. I'm just going to change it for him. <laughs> I don't know how to do that, but uh, if I start to mess it up enough, he'll come in and fix it. I'm sure he'll uh, help you out. <laughs> That's great. That actually would be a pretty good, uh, pretty good base head logo. 
I like it. Um, so, you know, I was going to say, hey, pro tip, back to the to the house concert thing. Like, I do a lot of house concerts. But the other thing I have gathered is that merchandising is a big hit at house concerts. So get your merchandise ready for when you do that thing that you're really not going to be able to do because you just can't do it. <laughs> you can't do I, it. I don't see it happening for you. Frankly. Oh, boy. <laughs> also, tell me tell me, I can't go to Europe or play the Ryman either while you're at it. That would be great. Absolutely not. It's not going to happen. Forget it. <laughs> so... Um, you still like bourbon, right? I love bourbon. All right. I'm, but I'm currently drinking a glass of Pinot Noir because I have a cold and I'm trying to be responsible. You know, I, my wife laughs, I say, or she laughs with me about it. Like when I'm sick, the only time I feel good is when I'm drinking. I'm just kidding. And well, I'm not, but, um, so I get it. yeah, for, um, a bourbon novice, what would you recommend? I have a few things I really like. Um, I was super into Eagle Rare for a while. I really, really like the Cask Strength Maker's Mark. And I also like Bullet. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar with, well, two of those, Bullet included. But cool. Yep, I saw it. <laughs> kind of depends on the mood. I, I, I got a kick out of the um, current album cover. And then I guess I just read today that you like bourbon there was something else for you uh squat squatching 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 oh squatching yeah sasquatching <laughs> my so my alphabetical list of likes yes. you know so sasquatching is like when people are taking a picture and you like act like you're sasquatch in the background before they notice so like they look at this really cute picture of themselves and there you are with like your like crouch down looking over your shoulder like sasquatch so you're you're, you're squatch bombing you're the squatch- photo yeah, you squatch bomb. <laughs> it's terrible, I know, but it's great. That's funny. I like it. Well, so anything else big on the on the horizon for the new year besides all that busy work that you set out to do the singles? Uh, we're going to make a new music video. Nice. How many of those did you make this year? Just uh, two. Like just one, two. One of them's like a live one, and one of them, my friend Meredith did Mr. Killer was the one for Wildflowers with like the uh, fighter pilot concept. I'm gonna go back and watch it. I think I saw a little bit of it. Um, the couple of videos I glanced at look really good. Uh, I didn't look to see like how many you had, but I thought well, it looks pretty prolific with the videos. But um, they look great, so I'm excited for you. You're gonna do a new one. Well, that when when do you think that'll come out? Um, probably. So my birthday is January 27th and all I ever ask for for my birthday is like a music video or studio time or something super useful that will keep me distracted from the fact that I'm turning another year older. Um, but we'll probably set to shoot that around then. Cool. I look forward to seeing it. (laughs) That's, Thank you. That's great. I love your I love your latest album. I'm looking forward to listening to the other stuff. Love the t-shirt. I have so enjoyed talking with you. I appreciate you making time for me with your head cold and everything. And I hope you feel better. Oh, thanks. This has been the highlight of my day. I forgot that I was sick, except for when I had to like try to turn away from the phone to cough. So thank you for calling. <laughs> it's almost like training horses, right? You forget about everything else. <laughs> Just kidding. It's yeah, not. you're just focused on the one, the one thing. <laughs> Sylvia if Rose. If I sound like Tom Waits, it's just the cold. It's fine. He's one of my heroes. It'll be okay. No, you know what? Only when you mentioned it did I even notice it, but I didn't notice it all. I bet you could <laughs> sing a full show tonight if you wanted to. So, Sylvia Rose, it was a really, it was a real pleasure. Um, I will definitely be talking to you very soon. Thank you. Let me know if you need anything from me. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Tell me if it's over Or if it's just begun Can you point me to the exit Can you tell me when to run There's a girl from Santa Ana And she won't let me sleep 
Now the storefronts all sit empty And the streets once made of gold Are painted black with ashes Of a story never told And the girl from Santa Ana Dressed to be the best Of the devils we hunt down It follows you on Deacon Street Down Mulholland Drive Breathing for the shadows As they slowly come alive Hey, thanks for listening. Question for you. Are you struggling to move your music journey forward? I can help. If not personally, then by referring you to the next best available resources. Schedule a free 15-minute call with me to find out if I can indeed help you. It's easy. Just visit unstoppingmusician.com forward slash coaching to schedule your call today. Look for links to just about everything covered in this episode in the show notes at unstoppingmusician.com forward slash podcast. This episode was powered by the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, How to Get Booked and Paid What You're Worth over and over again. 
It's available on paperback, Kindle, and ebooks just about everywhere you can find them. It's also available as a standalone podcast called the Unstarving Musician's Guide Podcast. You can learn more about the book and companion podcast at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash book. I'd love it if you picked up a copy and would love it even more if you left a review. With much gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell.